started talking to me one day, and I started this writing journey. And so I've been doing this about uh, 10 years now, and uh, I retired from the Army in 2016. By the way, the way that you don't do that is get a skin-eating bacterial infection that tries to eat a leg. That's not what you do. Uh, but you know, I had just been promoted to lieutenant colonel, that happened, and then it was kind of like, what am I going to do now? Well, fortunately at that point, I'd already started writing. And I'd written a couple of books at that point, and now I'm at 20 books overall. And uh, I enjoy teaching. This is something I do in my day job. I actually teach the U.S. Space Force Global Positioning System, so I really like precise timing. So what I want to share with you today is something I call the azimuth check. And these are some questions that I ask myself regularly during the product of a manuscript to kind of go through and, and see what we're going to do with a particular piece. How many of you have ever used a map and compass before? Raise your hand. Okay, so those of you that have your hands up, you can turn your brain off for 90 seconds. So a compass essentially is going to orient itself to north. So I have my trusty lens at a compass, which is telling me that north is roughly in that direction there. From there, I can say north is, I face north, east will be to my right, west is to my left, and south is somewhere behind me, right? General directions, everybody good? So now, if I'm talking about navigating with a compass, there's a couple different ways I can do this. Let's say I wanted to go from my position here on the stage to the coffee pots over there. So I would look at my compass, and I would say that my azimuth, or my bearing to the coffee, is roughly about 300 degrees, 300. Now, if I wanted to, I could actually just look at my compass and I could start walking 300 degrees. Is that smart? I'm going to fall off the stage. Then I'm going to have to end up walking over people in chairs and try to get over there. And it's not going to get me anywhere where I want to go without significant injury or a long length of time. I don't want to do that. So if I'm navigating to the coffee pots, I'm going to do one of two things. I'm going to do what's called dead reckoning, which means I'm going to kind of get an idea of where I'm supposed to go. I'm going to glance at my compass, and then I'm going to look at the terrain. And right here I can see, hey, I've got this nice little avenue I can walk down and go to the tables in the back and turn, so forth and so forth. Have I done anything structured with that? Just kind of feel, right? How many of you are pantsers? You're dead reckoners. Okay. If I wanted to plot, I'd say, okay, from my position on the stage, I would turn to an azimuth of 270 degrees. I would walk 25 paces to the end of the stage, another 10 paces down the ramp, and so forth and so on. That's plotting. Okay. Both of them get me where I'm supposed to go. But what I'm doing by taking an azimuth is I'm just giving myself an idea of where the story's going to go. Whether I'm a plotter or a pantser doesn't matter because I have an idea of story. How many of you have ever been watching a television show or a movie, you know what's going to happen next, and it does, right? You understand story at an intuitive level. So that's all we're talking about. Now, I have to give credit where credit is due. Uh, when we talk about the questions that I'm going to be going through with you here shortly, it comes back to my friend and mentor, Eric Flint. Um, Eric was uh, a tremendous individual. He passed away in July of this year, just about uh, two weeks before my traditionally published book, The Crossing, came out. Uh, Eric was the initial editor for the book. He was a champion of this alternate history novel that uh, some science fiction guy tried to write. And one of the things that Eric taught me is the question that's on the next slide. But to really kind of put it in perspective of who he was, Eric was, uh, he was a bit of a curmudgeon. And when he, when he talked to you, he had this, this deep, gravelly voice. He'd be like, Kevin, this is what you're going to do today. Really Oh, my, my mic keeps cutting out. It was really a And as we went through the process of me developing the crossing and writing the manuscript, he said, everything that you do in a manuscript comes down to one question. It comes down to one question. The question is, who gives a shit? Who gives a shit? Right? And when I first heard this, we were at a together, and I remember sitting there and kind of laughing. <laughs> okay, cool. How am I supposed to answer? me now? All right. So who gives a shit? How am I supposed to answer this, Eric? And he said, with everything you do. And I thought about it a little bit more, and it really comes down to a couple of things. This is internal and external. Externally, we want an audience to give a shit, right? We want them to care. We want them to understand what we're trying to do with our characters. We want them to understand the resonance we're trying to build with them. We want the audience to get involved. Let's face it, reading is a time suck. We have a lot of things that, we, that our readers might have to do, and we want to have them, we want their attention for the next two or three days, right? 
or shorter if they're really fast readers. We want to grab them and pull them in. So how do we do that? We have to make them care. But beyond that, then you have to look at it from the internal perspective. Do my characters really understand events that are happening? Do they understand the implications? Do they understand the overall stakes? Is their MacGuffin worth fighting for? Think about Raiders of the Lost Ark, the Lost Ark of the Covenant. We learned pretty quickly with Indiana Jones that this is a very important thing that he has to go and get. Do we really understand it? No. But we understand that it's a threat. So we understand those stakes. Is it worth it? When we talk about our characters, are their reactions authentic, genuine? Have you ever walked out of a movie theater or turned a channel or put a book down or sometimes throw it across the room? Chances are because you weren't engaging with your characters. You didn't care. And that's really what this, what this question comes down to. Now, to talk this through, it go back to my azimuth example with our journey. We're here at our starting point. Our ending point is somewhere off in that direction. Now, if you're a pantser right now, your spider sense is starting to tingle. Kevin's going to teach me story structure. No, I'm not. Okay? I do that a lot, but I'm not going to teach it to you today. When we talk about story, though, our story has a direction. And when we break down the, the 10 questions I'm going to go through with you, we're going to talk them through in beginnings, middles, and ends. Every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? So that's what we're going to talk this through. So there's four questions in the very beginning, three questions that we'll cover in the middle, and three questions that we'll cover at the end. And all of them point back to that who cares question. And this is a way that as you're in the process of writing a manuscript, if you've got who cares written on a post-it note on your wall or you have these questions written down next to your computer and you just consult them every once in a while, it's going to keep you on track because it's worked for me. Now, your mileage may vary. Standard disclaimer when we start talking about craft stuff. There's a, an awful lot of references out there for different types of craft presentations and whatnot. Take what resonates here with, me, for, with this class with me with you, and if it doesn't resonate, park it. Move on to something else. There's something, there's something in this presentation that you'll get, I'll guarantee. So we talk about our first question, am I starting in the right place? Now, from my own experience, the very first book I tried to write, this was back when I was on active duty, I was convinced I had the, the best character ever created in science fiction. And I had the best openings paragraphs because I was setting this character up with this important backstory that was going to be really awesome. And when I finally got to the point where I actually sold that novel several years later, I sat down with the editor, and she was very, very awesome and polite. We were sitting at a coffee shop, and she folds her hands in front of me. She says, I really love this book. I said, awesome, thanks. How did you like the beginning? She goes, you need to lose the first four chapters. And I said, what? I was completely struck by this. Why do I need to remove the four, the four, character, or the four chapters? She says, nobody's going to care about this. But I cared. I was the author. I was creating this, this character from the ether, right? I needed to make sure that all these things were there. You don't need to do that. You need to start in the right place. And the right place is this point later on in the manuscript. So I started thinking about it. Why here? Why now? Why this place? And if you think about it, one of, the, one of my favorite movies to talk about when we actually are talking about story structure is the original Star Wars movie in 1977, right? So Star Wars starts out with the little ship going off into the distance with the big ship flying overhead, shooting lasers at it, and we start asking questions. Do we need to know Luke Skywalker, Leia, all that stuff at that point? No. From that point forward, though, the movie starts to unfold because now it's drawn us in as an audience because we're asking ourselves, why is this happening? Who are the people on the little ship? Who are the people on the big ship? That's what we're trying to do. So a good hook is going to draw you in in that perspective. We always talk about the hook as far as introducing characters and introducing all their wants and their goals and all that stuff, but you also have to sink your fingernails into the reader's neck, right? Hey, this is why this is important, and you do that by causing them to ask questions. Now, I will tell you with 20 books under my belt, this gets easier over time. First couple times you do it, yeah, you might start in the wrong place. That's okay. You're going to get better at it. And if nothing else fails, the advice from Kurt Vonnegut, who's, he's kind of a successful author, right? Start as close to the end as possible. Figure out where that point is that's going to be the right, the right starting point for your novel and get your audience asking questions and get them involved in the situation, what's happening, and the characters that are there. Because again, it comes back to who cares. Now, what about prologues? Any fantasy authors in the, in the audience? Yeah, what about prologues? People always ask about prologues. Is it value added? Is it gonna set something up for later? 
One of the things that George R.R. Martin did really well with the, the first Game of Thrones book is he has the Ice Monster prologue, right? You get this huge, climactic, really awesome battle sequence. And it's really cool because it gives us an idea of the action that's going to be in this book. And it's like, yeah, this is awesome. Go to chapter one and I've got three chapters of backstory. But I've still got that promise of action. He's made me care enough to see what's going on in the future. So I'm completely invested at that point. So the prologue, as long as it's value added and it addresses the answer of who cares, you're on your way. Next one. Am I writing the correct protagonist? So your protagonist is, is the center of your story. If you get the opportunity on Thursday morning at 8 o'clock, I know it's 8 o'clock in the morning, but I'm right back here teaching all about character. We'll talk a little bit more about building a, a protagonist. But a protagonist is the center of the story. They are the one that everything is happening around. They are the one that's interacting in all those climactic parts. We get a full understanding of what's happening with them. So how do we write the right one? One of the ways we do this is to make them very different. Think about some of your favorite protagonists. Uh, anybody a, a, a Harry Dresden fan? Jim Butcher's books? Okay. Jim Butcher will tell you that when he was actually constructing Harry Dresden, his mentor had told him that only exaggerated characters really sell off. They really do things well, and they really draw the audience in. And he will tell you that he did the entire character uh, markup for Harry Dresden trying to prove her wrong. And so Harry Dresden has the, the big long coat, right? Sometimes carries the staff. He's a total wise ass. He stands out from everybody else in the book. It works. Anybody read Jack Reacher? Jack Reacher's the same way, right? Big, imposing, quiet type guy. The, the new television series does it really well. He's different from everybody else. So how can I set them apart? What am I doing to make them different? Because what you end up happening sometimes is that you'll write a secondary character and you really fall in love with that character, their voice, how they do things, their attitudes, they become very easy to write. And we call this the second banana problem. You know, you start writing that, that, uh, that other character and pretty soon your entire story is starting to gravitate towards their voice, towards their point of view. You're writing the wrong character. Okay? I've had this happen. I had a book uh, called Peacemaker that I had a secondary character named, uh, named Hex Allison and Hex was a lot of fun to write. He was a good-looking, smart mercenary in command of all these cool military forces, and he was kind of an ass-kicker. And I thought, man, this is great. I'm really, I'm really enjoying writing him. And about a chapter and a half in, I said, wait a minute, Kevin. You're doing this wrong. He's not your main character. You've got to pull back on this a little bit. And so I was able to do so. So asking yourself, am I writing the correct protagonist is huge. You know, and again, we'll talk more about the protagonist on uh, Thursday morning, but you've got to make sure that they're different. Could they be a completely clueless protagonist that is uh, unaware of the world around them? Luke Skywalker, anybody? Reluctant but driven? Play Reese Starling? Thomas Harris's uh, Hannibal Lecter books? Are they different? How can you make them different? How can you make them stand out and, again, make them resonate with us? Question number three, though, who's the antagonist? Now, I get to do a whole presentation on the antagonist uh, tomorrow. I'm actually filling in for the, the great Kate Pickford, which is kind of hard to believe that I'm filling in for someone like that, but who is the antagonist? I will tell you, without spoiling my slides for tomorrow, your antagonist is as equally important to your story as your protagonist. Okay, they're as equally important as your protagonist. We have to understand their motivation, we have to understand their story, and we have to, in the very beginning, get the feeling that they are in conflict with our protagonist. How do we do that? Well, if you think about it, the antagonist is always the hero of their own story, right? They are doing things that they should be doing based off of their life, based off of their job, based off of their sense of duty. How can I make them stand out apart from my, my protagonist? I do this through what we call diametrical opposition. Okay? We'll spend more time on goals tomorrow, on uh, Thursday morning with characters, but if my character wants to destroy the Death Star, Luke Skywalker, the antagonist of Star Wars wants to use the Death Star to pacify the galaxy. They are completely diametrically opposed. Their goals stand 100% apart from each other. They're total opposites. And I won't spoil this for you, but the antagonist for Star Wars is not who you think it is. Why should we care? What is so important about our antagonist that we need to see them in this, in this light? How can I portray them as being bad if they're the hero of their own story. 
I do that by their goals and by making them, again, diametrically opposed to those of the protagonist. Okay? Last question for the beginning. What's everybody else doing? Everybody write books with just one character? No, we have lots of characters. We have an entire cast of characters. All of them have goals. All of them have things that they want to do. If I start addressing this, I can do a couple of things. One, I can do more with conflict in the future, especially if their goals don't necessarily match up with their, their compatriots, right? Think about Han Solo and Princess Leia. Their goals match up? No. Leia wants to save the rebellion, right? Han Solo wants his money. He just wants to get paid. They have this, I mean, this initial relationship that is extremely caustic, and you know, they're, they're at each other's throats a little bit. But then you know, later on, Han says, I don't know if I want to like, if I like that girl, if I want to kill her, right? We set their, their goals, we set up their needs in different ways because all of them play a role. So I talked about Han and Leia from Star Wars. What's C-3PO's goal? He wants to avoid everything, right? He wants to be safe, avoid conflict. What's Chewbacca's goal? He wants to protect Han. Understanding the side character's goals and what they want to do will influence how you approach the rest of the story. And especially in the beginning of the book, if you're addressing this, it gives you the opportunity to then follow their development as you go through. You still keep your protagonists separate. You keep them the center of the story. But as you need to, you can actually work with those side characters and bring them along and say, here are some important things that are happening in the universe or in the story for my side characters that are going to affect things overall. Because again, going back to the who cares question, if they understand each other, if they're working together, if something happens, something breaks, someone dies, that reaction is authentic. It has to be. Otherwise, we as the audience put down the book, change the channel, walk out of the movie theater. So we need to make sure that that's authentic as much as possible. So those goals add depth and conflict to the story. That takes us to the end of the beginning. It's always easiest to start a journey, right? You start walking down a dark trail, you can always kind of turn over your shoulder and make sure that you know, the, the beginning part of the trailhead's back behind you. What happens when you get out here in the middle? Everybody like writing the middle of a story? Those of you that don't have your hands up, be honest with yourselves. <laughs> okay. We call it the soggy middle, right? This is where things tend to bog down. We tend to slow down a little bit. We, stand, we start to just kind of, what am I doing here? I've written these great characters. I've set up this great conflict. How do I keep going? I don't necessarily see my end point down there anymore. Actually, I can't because they moved the coffee. But how do I do this? I, I've lost track. You do this by asking yourself, again, a couple of questions. Is my antagonist really bad? So the antagonist for Star Wars is Grand Moff Tarkin. It's not Darth Vader. Tarkin is the antagonist. And when we first see Tarkin, the very first scene with him, he's not doing anything menacing or commanding. He's in a staff meeting. Everybody likes staff meetings? I hate staff meetings. But he's in a staff meeting. And he's got all these generals and admirals around him, and Darth Vader standing in the back with his hands over his chest, going, oh, bah, and all that stuff, right? Tarkin is this guy that's in charge of the staff meeting. So we all think, okay, bureaucrat, got it. He's, he's the officer in charge, whatever, okay. But then we see him actually tell Vader to stop, right? When Vader's force choking the guy, and Vader stops. So this guy's got some power to him. But the next time we see Tarkin, after that scene, what does he do? He says, schedule Leia for execution. Okay, this has escalated a little bit. And the next time we see him after that, he's brought Leia up. They've arrived at Alderaan. He questions her. He demands the location of the, of the rebel base. She lies to him. And what does he do? Oh, awesome. Cool. Fire. Now, he's gone from powerful to really bad in a very short time frame. We've seen him be the bureaucrat, to now he's, you know, he's threatened Leia with execution. Now he's destroyed an entire planet and untold millions of lives. He's bad. So he's powerful, he has this power at his disposal, and he's committed. He is willing to use the Death Star, like he says, to pacify the galaxy. So if he doesn't pacify the galaxy, what's the point? We see him early do this, and it provides action. Okay? And the action of an antagonist is critical to the middle of your book. Because if your antagonist does not have enough to do, guess where your book dies? In the middle. 
Okay? I've had this happen. Several years ago, I was writing my, my debut novel that became Sleeper Protocol. It sold in 2016. And I was with a couple of friends of mine who had, I'd been bouncing ideas off as a little mini writers group for a while. And we were driving from where I live in Colorado Springs up to Denver. And we were up going up for a, a convention. And we'd been talking about some stuff. And I was sitting in the back seat because I had had foot surgery. So I was propped up, you know, kind of laid back. And we were arriving at the hotel and walking in from the parking garage. And this idea hit me with this book. What if I change the antagonist to this other character? I'm not going to spoil that one for you. What if I change the antagonist to this other character? And I said that to my friends, and both of them stopped and looked at me. That's brilliant. And the book that I'd been trying and struggling to write flew out of my head in the next seven weeks. So I was actually able to go and complete that novel by changing the antagonist because I needed them to be really bad. I needed to have that sense of action. I needed for what they were doing to become apparent to the protagonist. Go back to my Star Wars example. Right after we see Alderaan destroyed, Luke and, and Obi-Wan and the crew are on the, are on the Millennium Falcon, right? And they get to Alderaan. Alderaan's not there. The stakes become apparent to Luke at that point. Critical, critical juncture of the story because now this action beat has now led into further understanding because up to this point, what is Luke Skywalker's goal in the first half of the movie? He wants to leave being a moisture farmer on Tatooine and go to the Flight Academy with his friends. Who runs the Flight Academy? The Empire. Luke Skywalker's clueless, but all this stuff unfolds in the first half of the movie that changes the stakes, that changes Luke's understanding because we have this action of the antagonist. But then you've got to go on to the next question. Am I continuing to deliver on the promise of conflict? Conflict is extremely important. We want to make sure that things are moving forward. Those character goals, just like Luke's, change. Okay, how does this come about? How are they taking action? When they become aware of the stakes, does it matter to them? Again, going back to that, that who cares question on the internal side, Luke Skywalker, does he have anything to do with Alderaan? No. Does he understand the catastrophic loss of a planet? Yes. And he starts to realize that those guys who I thought I wanted to go and fly for might not be all that good. He starts to recognize what the problem is. And because of this, his change and his understanding of what's going to need to happen, when they find Leia is on board the Death Star, they go to rescue her and so forth and so on, that conflict continues to escalate. The trials and the stakes continue to change and get harder for Luke Skywalker. This is incredibly important because if they're not changing, if Luke is not changing, this is the movie we walk out of. Luke Skywalker is a whiny farm boy at the beginning of the movie. If he gets to the end of the movie down there and he's supposed to be hopping into an X-Wing and flying off to be the hero of the Rebel Alliance and he's still a whiny farm boy, I was six years old when Star Wars came out. I can tell you I probably would have never bought those toys or anything along those lines. I wouldn't have cared about Luke Skywalker because he didn't change over time. And he got there because what was happening to him was being forged in conflict. Now, is the character learning? Okay, character growth is, is a class in and of itself. I could literally talk to you for two hours about character growth because this is so vital. The character cannot be the same at the end as they were at the beginning of the book. They must change. Okay, one of the ways that we often do this are what we call try-fail cycles. You might hear them say, I might hear them called yes-no cycles. What this means is the character tries, they fail, but they keep moving forward. And the next time they try, so the, uh, the action might be a little bit more, might be a little bit more uh, difficult for them, but they're still going to fail. They do something good, they have to deal with the bad. Does that happen to us in real life, by the way? This is a huge piece of resonance with the reader. If you think about characters that always succeed, do we like them? Yeah. James Bond, anybody? James Bond always succeeds. For the longest time, we just wanted to see how he was going to succeed what cool gadgets he was going to use, whatever else. But Bond always won. Sean Connery movies, Bond always won. Sean Connery leaves, they bring in George Lazenby, Honor Majesty's Secret Service. Anybody seen that movie? It's my favorite of the Bond movies, except for the Daniel Craig ones. Because Bond's a human being. He goes from being the suave super spy who always wins to being, oh my gosh, I'm in love. And now I'm going to get married. What do you think the audiences did? A lot of people had a problem because Bond didn't win. Things change. Humans 
don't always win. We fail. As a writer, I will tell you from personal experience that having your characters fail is a liberating experience because you get to dig deeper into their psyche. You get to dig deeper into what they do. Because if they're always winning, that's great. Now I just got to figure out what bigger stakes I can make them win on. But if I have them fail and I have them have to come back and question their own uh, motivations and whatnot, now I can dig deeper into their character. I can give them more resonance for you, the reader, to actually be able to pull you deeper into the story because like we just said, we're not all successful all the time. We fail. How we respond to failure gives us depth, gives us meaning, gives us drive, commitment, those types of things. It should do the same thing to our characters. Now, at the end, we've taken all the things we've set up, all the conflicts, we've, we've made all the action beats work together. When we get to the ending, there's three things we have to remember. The first thing is, are all the pieces on the board? Do I get my characters physically and developmentally where they need to be? Now, I will tell you from experience, this is important, and it's, it's kind of fun that my co-authors in the audience for this, my friend Kevin Steverson and I were writing a book in our Four Horsemen universe called Redacted Weapon, and we had a crew of mercenaries that had been abandoned on a planet, and we were about two-thirds of the way through the book, and I recognized we've forgotten one of them. How in the world do we forget this character? And I write back, hey, Kevin, we forgot, we forgot so-and-so. We need to go back in and, and put her back into the script. And we were able to do so at that point because we recognized all the pieces weren't on the board. Okay? If you forget something or you haven't set it up, this is the final part before you, you commit yourself to the resolution of the story where you need to go back and fix that, where you take the opportunity to say, hey, you know what, I forgot this character, or I didn't plant this seed the way I needed it to be for it to be clear enough when I got to this point. So in the process of writing your manuscript, in the process of doing your own self-editing and reviewing as you're going, or even just going back and reading it before you start the next day, are all my pieces on the board? Because if something's missing, who's going to be the first person to find it? Your readers. And they're going to send you that email of, hey, where'd so-and-so go? You don't want that email. We want to make sure that our pieces are on the board. So have I set up everything that needs to happen there? All right. Kind of in, in concert with this question, am I stepping backward? Okay. How many of you ever read a book or got into a, a television show and you get to the, like, the very end of the season and there's a piece of information that you've forgotten that they have to go back in a flashback, right? Like the Scooby-Doo flashback. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay. You don't want to do that either. If I have to step backward or if I haven't put all my pieces on the board, the end is not the time for new information. Now, you can also use this, though, to answer any lingering doubts from your audience. Let's go back to my example from Star Wars, right? We talk about Luke Skywalker being the whiny farm boy to becoming the hero of the Rebel Alliance. And we see him grow and we see him change. By the way, it's his idea for them to go down and get Chewbacca with Chewbacca in handcuffs to get Princess Leia, not Han's. It's a tactical idea. It's a real kind of decision that you wouldn't think Luke would make. But over the course of the second half of the movie, Luke continues to do great leadership things. And you see him change. But then you get to the big final end briefing. And Luke is sitting there next to all these other pilots from the Rebel Alliance, and he's in the X-Wing flight suit. Have you ever thought about that? How did Luke suddenly become a pilot? Do we know? No. But there's one thing that happens right after that briefing. Luke goes into the hangar. He talks to Han, tries to convince him. Han says, no, I'm going to take the money and run. And then Luke is despondent. He's walking away, and his buddy Biggs, his friend, comes up. and Hey, it's great to see you. Glad that you're here. And then the flight leader comes up, gold leader, and Biggs says, don't worry about Luke, he's the best bush pilot on the rim. Have we seen Luke Skywalker fly anything in this movie? No. But because of that statement by Biggs down there and that's that critical scene, we believe it when Luke Skywalker climbs into the X-Wing. So I didn't have to go back and show Luke busting womp rats in the whatever canyon it is that he talks about. I didn't have to see him fly in a T-16 or whatever else. I got that one piece of information in a short validation moment. And again, six-year-old me completely bought off on Luke Skywalker being the, X -wing, the best X-Wing pilot in the galaxy. And he'd never even flown the thing. Okay? I don't want to produce new information. I don't want to give something here that I could have done earlier. 
we always have the tendency as writers to want to info dump, right? And we always caution ourselves and we try not to do the big info dumps. The ending is not a place for any of this. The ending is where you're capitalizing on all the action and the conflict you've set up in the, in the middle of your book to be able to take all that, wrap it together, and then amplify the stakes. I can't amplify the stakes if I'm tossing out new information. But if I need to, I can do one simple little validation point like Biggs did with Luke that buys it off for the reader. Not exactly the best thing that you can do, but I didn't have to go back and go through a flashback or anything along those lines. The final question though, life or death? Are my stakes life or death? Now, in the, the story structure classes I like to teach, uh, and the one in particular where we actually talk about a book called My Story Can Beat Up Your Story by Jeffrey Allen Schechter, this is actually one of Schechter's questions. Do, do the stakes of my story come down to life or death? Because every story comes down to life or death. And immediately, some of you have already got the, the tingle in the back of your head going, wait a minute, nope, nope. Comedies don't necessarily come down to life or death. Romance doesn't come down to life or death. And I would challenge you on that because... Let me give you a movie example. How many of you have seen the movie Liar, Liar with Jim Carrey as the lawyer who is compelled now to tell the truth? Anybody die at the end of that movie? No. But if he can't learn to tell the truth all the time to all the people that love him, his relationship with his son will die. So it's not a literal death. It's a figurative death. It is final. It is clear. There is no turning back. Life or death. Now, do the stakes matter to you, the writer? Are you passionate about what you write? Hope so. It's a big thing. Be, be passionate about what you do. Be proud of what you do. Every once in a while, you're going you're gonna to plan something, or you're going to be writing something, and you're going to have that moment of, I, I don't know about this. You need to push through. I was writing my book, Fields of Fire, again in the Forestman universe, and I had set this entire book up where I had a young human peacemaker, think of a, like a, a, U, a U.S. Marshal sort of a thing. So this law enforcement officer, is he's being mentored by another peacemaker. And this other peacemaker, in our universe, this, this species is reviled. They're, they're always into everything. They're causing all the problems. They are, they're the bad guys. So when you see one of them appear in the books, you're like, oh, that's the bad guy. Automatically, you, just, you, you write the entire species off. But as I was writing this book, this, this particular peacemaker, she had honor. She was really good at what her, what her job was, and she was trying to mentor this young human to really get him to pay attention to what it meant to be this, in this position in this galaxy. And I was, totally worked this out in my, in my process where I was going to kill off the young human. I was going to kill him off to teach everybody a lesson. That I was gonna, I was gonna make sure that, you know, I knew the stakes were gonna be important, but I wanted to make sure that everyone understood what this honor really meant. And so it's late at night. I, I have a, a family. My, my wife and my daughters were asleep. It was 10 o'clock at night. I'm sitting on the couch with my, with my trusty laptop, and I'm, I'm getting ready to write this scene. And I've plotted this out. I had all my beats down. I, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. And I started writing the chapter, and I froze. And this voice in the back of my head was, Kevin, this is wrong. The stakes might matter to you, but they don't matter to your characters. If you take away him, are you really teaching the lesson? And I thought about it for a minute, and then I recognized I need to kill her. I need to kill off the mentor character. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to deviate from my plan. I'm going to write this scene. So I write this scene, and about halfway through, I'm bawling. <laughs> you know, sobbing, but you know, tears running down my face, and I'm recognizing I'm onto something here. And I write this scene out, get it completely out of my head, and immediately do the writerly thing, which is second guess myself, right? Everybody second guess yourselves. So I'm laying in bed before I go to sleep thinking that's got to be the most terrible thing I've ever written in my life. I probably need to, to scrap it and go back and do my plan. So I made myself a promise that it was going to be the weekend, and I was going to go that next morning to Starbucks with the intent to edit and redo the scene. So I go to Starbucks, and my Starbucks, where I, where I was going at that point in time, had the nice high bar right there by the baristas. So I get my breakfast sandwich and my coffee, and I sit down, and I open up the laptop to edit the scene. And five minutes later, I'm bawling in Starbucks. And they're like, are you okay? I'm a writer. I'm fine. But I recognized at that point, what I had done was I had made the stakes matter to the characters. 
What I wanted to do and what mattered to me was a little bit secondary to what needed to happen to them. And so by actually going through and doing this, I ramped up the emotional resonance part. And if you go back and watch my emotional resonance presentation from last year, the end of the story is that my dad didn't speak to me for a week because I killed that character off. So you want to be in that place at some point where you, you, you call your dad, hey, what's going on? And he says, I'm not speaking to you and hangs up on you. So what does this all mean? So these 10 questions all point back to the one we started at the very beginning with who cares, who gives a shit? Am I in the right place? Who's going to care? Your readers. Do I need to have three chapters of, of backstory or can I jump right into the story? Anybody familiar with uh, the great Elmore Leonard, uh, American crime novelist, wrote a lot of westerns? Elmore Leonard was famous for dropping you in media res, right into the middle of a scene. And you're in the middle of a scene at the beginning of the book with all these characters that you're not quite sure they're actually good or not, and you have to figure it out. You can totally do that. Is it going to be the right place for your story to start? The right protagonist is critical. You have to have the right protagonist as you go forward. Otherwise, where are you? You're writing the wrong character. You're going to lose your audience because you're thinking you're just going to be writing about Batman or you're going to be reading about Batman and you're following Alfred the butler. You can't do that. The story has to be focused on that protagonist. Are the, is the antagonist a threat? What are their goals? What are they doing? Are those goals in conflict to the, to the protagonist? Does that make them really bad? All works together. Do I have enough conflict? Do I, is my protagonist growing? Are all the pieces on the board? All of these questions are glances at the compass. Whether I'm a pantser or a plotter, it doesn't matter. I know where I'm going. I have an idea of what my bearing is. And as I'm going through the manuscript, I can look at that question that's mounted on the wall and say, who cares? Am I addressing that right now? Am I addressing what needs to happen? And just to show you that this, this actually works, this is from a friend of mine who's an aspiring writer. He's written a few short stories. And I told this story to him as I was developing this presentation. And he said, I'm going to put that on my wall. He's got two young kids, so he, he changed the wording a little bit, which I'll give him credit for. But that's on his wall. Who cares? Every scene, every paragraph, every interaction, every character that you write, who's going to care about them? If you want the audience, your readers, to care about them as much as you do, your due diligence is to ask that question and answer it every time you sit at the keyboard. I was going through the crossing with Eric Flint. This is, it's still kind of hard. Uh, about halfway through the book, and Eric had this thing where he would do, he'd make his comments and then highlight them in bright yellow. And about halfway through the book, he says, oh, I recognize what you're doing here. Go back and answer that question I told you about. Do it in these three, three chapters. And if you can answer this question, this book is going to sell. And he was right. All I had to do was go back and figure out who cared and make them care about that manuscript as much as I care. So i am got a couple minutes for questions. I'm finishing just about four minutes earlier than I, than I forecast, so that's pretty cool. So what, are, what if any questions you all have about story mapping like this and giving yourself that glance at the compass? Do you think that this is something a writer can do for herself, or does she need outside eyes to find out whether or not she's satisfying these requirements? I think that's a great question. And I think, I think it's twofold. It's certainly something you can do for yourself. And again, posting the question on the board or just internalizing and saying, am I, am I addressing this as I go through? As you're working and, and putting out work, hopefully you have a beta reader or a first reader that's working with you. Make sure they know this question. Make sure that they know it's a, this is important to you. I have a first reader, and she is very aware of this question. This is the thing that's always top of mind for us when we're going through a manuscript. Am I hitting the right beats? Because I can develop great characters. I can develop really cool plots. I want you to care about it. And if I'm missing something, if I'm missing that boat, if I don't see it, I need somebody on my team that's going to be able to see it for me. So I think it's a critical piece. Yes, sir. A quick question on the antagonist. I've, I've got one in my head, but it's also the institution. And sometimes that main person antagonist could represent the institution. I just wanted your take on that. You're absolutely right. The, the antagonist can be a representation of something larger. When we think about Star Wars, talking about Grand Moff Tarkin, the real antagonist in the entire Star Wars movie uh, 
genre is the Emperor, right? Emperor Palpatine. But we don't see him in the first movie at all. So Tarkin is his representative. So even though we understand that there's a greater evil that's out there, the guy that's on the scene representing him is clearly the antagonist, even though that bigger evil does exist out there and is often referenced. Did that answer your question? Okay, cool. Oh, that one's somebody coming up in the back. You don't have to run. <laughs> My timekeeper said, tell me you have time, so. So if you were we're working done. on becoming an outliner, how would you integrate these into your outline? It seems like you could almost put these as your outline. And my second question is, what percentage do you stop uh, sharing new information? Is that like the 75% mark? Sure, so let me answer that one first. So I wanna try to stop sharing information at the midpoint of the story, roughly for that 50% mark, because that's where my characters are gonna stop reacting to the world around them, and they're gonna start taking action. And that action is all new. So if I can do that by the midpoint, I've, I've done my job there. As far as making these questions part of the outline, absolutely. Again, this kind of comes back to, to where you are with different things. I will tell you that my outlining process now, 20 books in, is different than that first one. And it is a lot more questions. It is a lot more things that I've learned from my experience. Hey, hey dummy, did you do what you, what you need to do in this act? It's also why I do things differently now than I did before, where I actually stop in the middle of a manuscript at the end of my first act, that beginning phase. I go back and read the entire thing. Did I establish everything that needed to be done? Or what are the things that I need to follow on as I get into the middle of the book? And then that lets me get through the next couple of pieces in short order. So a little bit of both. Thanks for your question. Um, so in terms of like the protagonist, uh, I guess the way that you explained it kind of referred to a singular protagonist. But what about? where there are multiple protagonists. And I'm not talking about uh, the protagonist and uh, like their friends, their side characters or right. something. I'm talking about two characters or more that are equally as important uh, and having to write them in a way that they're balanced so that uh, one gets a spotlight while the other also gets a spotlight or both of them get the chance to. Um, how would you go about doing that? So when you work with dual protagonists, they have goals. Both of them have goals. You keep them at the same level. You keep them where their goals, both of them, are, again, opposite those of your antagonist. If you can do that with both of them and keep them front and center at the same time, you have no problem because that conflict that you have in a story comes from those goals. What do they want to do? What are they trying to do? And as long as both of your protagonists have those goals that are directly opposite those of your antagonist, you'll be fine. Good afternoon, sir. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm looking over here. <laughs> so it, it sounds like you're generally saying uh, we, need to, we need to be aware of, of who's going to care. And uh, depending on what the situation is, we might need to adjust the plot um, or, or adjust some elements uh, be, being sensitive to, to who is going to care about this or that. But would you ever work the other direction? Say I have an event in a story that has to happen this way because that's I mean, the whole story structure around it. Right. Uh, but then you realize that maybe the reader or maybe the characters aren't going to care about the event enough. Would you add context prior to that? or like? I would find a way to make them care. If it's important enough for you to say this, this has to be part of the story, it has to be important to your characters in the same way. So what is it about that event that needs to happen in your mind that will also affect how the characters react and, and the overall stakes of your story? So I think that if you can address why it's important to you in the mindset of your characters, you'll be all right. And so, sorry, I'll think about it. Thank you. And, yes, so I'll be available up here for any questions. If you would like a copy of the presentation, you can text 66866 with story structure, all caps or all, all, all undersized, however you want to do it, and we'll go from there. Thank you very much.